episode 25. Welcome, friends. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm Kirk Van Odeham, the host of Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. This is the podcast that provides brief, thoughtful, biblical answers to your questions. I'm looking forward to answering this question on the topic that I have for today. And the topic is the alleged missing verses of modern translations of the Bible. Before I get into that, I do want to remind our listeners, and if you're a new listener, I will invite you uh, to check out our website. That's kirkvan.com, K-I-R-K-V-A-N.com. And that's the website for the podcast. There you can click on the podcast li- link and discover all the various ways that you can access Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. It's available, available as an audio podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and many, many others. All those links that are, are there on the website. And of course, you can always just go to the app or service of your choice and search for Bible FAQ with Kirk Van, and most likely you'll find it. But if not, check out kirkvan.com and find the link to the podcast app that you prefer. And then also we have video content available on our YouTube channel and also on our Facebook watch page through our Facebook page. And uh, you can get those links also through our website, kirkvan.com. As always, invite you to submit a question to be addressed on a future episode of this podcast. You can do so through the website. Just click on the contact link and fill out a form. You can do so through our Facebook page. Uh, like our page, connect with us, facebook.com slash Bible FAQ with Kirk Van, and then you can PM us a question uh, through that platform. Or you can always email us, and the email address is ask, A-S-K, ask at kirkvan.com, ask at kirkvan.com. Send us an email, uh, get in hold of us in any way, and we'll be uh, happy to Add your question to our list and and try to answer those on future episodes. Well, I do want to get to our question for today, and I, I have to disclose something here. I've started this pot, this episode a couple times now, and uh, on this question, and it's a complex topic, and I don't want it to be boring, so I don't want to get bogged down in a lot of information. But I just basically want to explain. Uh, on this topic, this alleged uh, missing verses in modern translations of the New Testament. There's a good explanation for all this that I want to convey to you. So I'm going to try to do it here and uh, try to be somewhat extemporaneous here and uh, do so in a way uh, that is kind of simple and basic. So I'm going to try to avoid the temptation to, you know, give a lot of detailed information here and just get to the heart of, of this question. So the question really stems uh, from a conversation here I had recently uh, with Rachel uh, from Indiana. And, uh, and I'm just, I just wrote a little summary here uh, of the exchange. So here's my summary. Rachel says, my husband brought me a, or bought me a new international version study Bible. I've been reading it and I like it, but I also have some concerns I've heard that some Christians have a negative view of the NIV and some of the other modern Bible translations claiming it deliberately alters some versions or some verses rather and completely removes others. Without even researching into it, I've noticed a couple of verses that appear to be significantly different. So I've been wondering if it is a good idea to even use this version. Well, this is a question that in you know phrased different ways but on the same general topic this is a question i've received a lot uh, over the years of ministry people wanting to know about particular versions or just you know modern translations in general because there's a lot unfortunately there's a lot of misinformation actually which is what most of this stems from Uh, and so i just want to kind of get to the heart of the issue now let me say right from the onset yes there are some Um, obvious differences between the King James Version that many of us are accustomed to and know best and uh, the the majority of the other modern translations. But as I'll explain, there's a a pretty good explanation as to why that's the case. Uh, 
Before I go any further, I just want to emphasize a very important point, and that is whatever differences exist, whether it be in you know English translations, whether it be in the uh, variants in the in the manuscripts themselves, um, whatever differences exist, they do not jeopardize in any way any spiritual principle, any moral precept, any doctrinal tenet. Uh, I'm not just speaking about the major ones, even minor ones. Our understanding of what the Word of God says is not impaired in any way by any of these discrepancies. Um, and so we don't need to worry about that. We can pick up uh, the vast majority of English translations. We can pick up and have uh, full confidence that we are reading the Word of God. Um, there's reasons for the differences, and that's because it's a challenging uh, and complicated process to, to translate any text from one language, much less an ancient language, into another language. So there's always going to be some interpretation decisions that need to be made. Uh, but actually, we're at, a, we're at a better position, I believe, to have other options and other viewpoints and things that we consider to be better help us understand uh, what some of those choices, those interpretation, translation choices, what have you, actually are so we can have a broader understanding of what um, this Word of God is actually conveying to us. So when it just comes to translations in general, there's two issues at stake, really. There's two things we need to consider when comparing different English translations. One is just like the translation methodology. And what I mean by translation methodology is just kind of the philosophy or the process that the translators of whatever version it is have adopted uh, in interpreting the original text for translation. And I won't get into that today because it's kind of another topic, uh, but that's why we have different reading levels, different linguistic styles, um, different you know vocabulary, some more modern up to date, some simpler, some more complex, some more literal, some more dynamic what have you. And so those are choices that have to be made. Uh, um, and I, I don't want to get into this part of it, but it's not as simple as this word in Greek means this word in English. Um, that's not the case uh, hardly ever. And it's even more complex when you consider the different grammatical structures, some of which don't even, uh, aren't even, there's not even comparable parallels for between languages. So there's different things that have to be accounted for. So that's that's one thing in, in the translation methodology. But the bigger issue and the one that's more germane to this topic of these alleged missing verses is on the topic of textual criticism. Now, many people hear textual, textual criticism and they think, oh, that means people are critical of the Bible. Like they don't like it or they're trying to disprove it or they're trying to minimize it. They're trying to say it's full of errors or they're trying to say, that's not at all what textual criticism means. It's a little bit misleading title. Textual criticism is just the process by which the original Greek manuscripts have been vetted and compiled uh, into a single Greek text before the translation into English process even begins. And there's a few different ways throughout history. There's a few different um, ways that that has been done, three primary ways, and that accounts for the differences and the alleged missing verses that we, uh, or, or the, the discrepancies in, in these verses that we see between, for example, the King James Version of the Bible that many of us are used to and some of the more modern translations, the NIV, but not only the NIV, I don't want to pick, pick on it, that's just what the question was for this particular case, but virtually all of the modern translations. So, before we get into what these three different um, major compilations or what they call textual foundations are, um, it's important to realize some people are surprised to find out that the original autographs of the books of the Bible do not exist uh, today and haven't existed in any time that we know of in history. Obviously, they existed at one time, but no, there's no record of anybody actually having access to them. In other words, when 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 Moses wrote the Torah, obviously he wrote that on some material. Those original materials don't exist today. Uh, they, when exactly they they no longer were available is not known to us. Uh, and by the way, this is not unique of the Bible. This is true of any document or any work of of the uh, that's as ancient as the books of the Bible are. Um, 
we we don't have any of the original autographs from anything of that time in history. That's just not they typically don't last that long unless there's very dramatic preservation techniques are employed, and that just wasn't the case. Um, so what we have then is, is copies. Like so, you know, take the Book of Romans for example. Paul wrote it. He sent it to the Roman Church. They kept it, I'm sure, for quite a long time. They had a scribe make a copy of it so that they could disseminate it to other people and places. And the other scribes made copies of those copies so that it could be transmitted even more widely. And until the advent of the printing press in the mid 15th century, that was the only option, that was the only available means by which transmission of the Bible took place. Manual, individual copies, letter for letter, word for word, sentence for sentence, page for page, book for book. And so it's not a very efficient process. It is not a perfect process because of, of the integration of human error, which is inevitable, certainly. We understand that. Um, and and it's, just, it's just a foolish thing to think that that wouldn't happen. It's not, not only is it not practical to believe it, but it's just not the case based on the evidence that we have. But at any rate, so we have all these different documents that come down to us from time. In the New Testament, I'm just going to stick to the New Testament for the for the sake of time. In the New Testament, uh, we have complete manuscripts of the Bible that date back to the uh, early 4th century, like 330 A.D. is the first complete, uh, all accounted for individual manuscript of the New Testament in Greek. But we have ones that are much older than that as far as individual books and partial manuscripts that date back even to... Uh, within 50 years of the time of the writing of the New Testament, some complete books up to the year AD 200. So again, it's not unusual. It's what we would expect for an ancient text of the sort that this is. Uh, but that's the reality of the situation. That's what we have in copies of copies of those throughout history for thousands of years, a couple thousand years, or at least, you know, 1,500 years until the printing press came along. Um and so at some point, especially after the advent of the printing press, it was, it was, you know, reasonably concluded, hey, you know, all over the world, there's these different, um, there's these different copies of these manuscripts. What we really need to have is a single authoritative text uh, that is standardized. We need to compile these into one. Uh, so that there's a standard text for the purpose of study, for the purpose of translation, for the purpose of printing. And again, there's the advent of the printing, printing press that really made this an important thing. And so they began to do just that. And the most, uh, the one that kind of won the day was uh, in uh, 1516, uh, a, a Dutch theologian named Erasmus he developed what was known as the uh, Textus Receptus, which is Latin for received text, the received text. So in 1516, his compilation, for lack of a better word, of the New Testament uh, manuscripts was, uh, was, was printed, it was published. And so the idea was that would become the standard and we can translate into other languages, we can use it as a study tool, we can make you know, print it now and make numerous copies of it for the whole world to have, which was a great thing. It was a, it was a great idea. It was a wonderful thing. And I won't get into stories about how he was rushed because of, of competing with another publisher. And there's stories, uh, all kind of thing. But there is uh, some information that's good, to, that's helpful to know. Uh, reportedly, Erasmus had access to about a dozen or fewer uh, manuscript, Greek manuscripts. Now, that's significant to note because today we have access to about 5,800 manuscripts as the copy, is the, is the, uh, is the um, number that's typically given. So he had access to about a dozen. Uh, so, um, you know, that's, that's one thing that maybe is a weak argument for, you know, the received text being the quote unquote best one. It's just, he didn't have access. Now you can imagine, um, you know, this was back in, again, this was the late 16th, uh, late 15th, early 16th century that it was being, this work was being done. They didn't have, he didn't have, 
he didn't have the technology. He didn't have the means of transportation. They didn't have photographs to share, you know, resources and manuscripts. They didn't have communication methods uh, that we had to transmit documents and, and even talk on the phone to find out where you can get more uh, manuscripts available to you or whatever. So he did the best with the resources he had. Um, but he only had a limited number and he did not even have reportedly complete act. There was gaps in what he had. So he actually had to translate some of the, he didn't have um, original manuscripts for every chapter of every book of the New Testament. So he had to translate some from the Latin to fill in the gaps. So this was not a perfect manuscript, but it was very good. Now it's interesting to note that later in the 19th century, another uh another text was being developed. We call it the majority text today. Sometimes it's called the ecclesiastical text or sometimes the Byzantine text. But this majority text uh, was an, it began being developed in the 19th century. It had the same purpose, to develop a standard text. But this time, there's thousands more uh, manuscripts available. Technology and communication and is way better, so they think that they can make major improvements to the text, and they certainly that's reasonable to conclude, given all the variables. So the majority text is actually a reaction to the critical text, which I'll mention here in a moment. They had a you know a philosophical difference in the methodology being used to develop the critical text. So the majority text. Use uh, it, it improved upon the received text in one in one main way or two ways really. One way was that they had access to many more texts, so they could verify the reliability, and it actually vindicated the the received text in many ways in the King James version upon which it and the other Bible English translations on which it, the was based on the received text. It vindicated it in that. Uh, now that there's many more texts, we found out that the text that the majority text developed was very similar in many ways to the received text. So despite the limitation that the received text had, the end result was it put together a very good, very accurate, very complete uh, uh, text of the Bible. Um, there are about 1,800 variants between the received text and the majority text, so they are not the same thing despite what some people believe. Uh, but the, again, those variants are very minor, virtually uh, insignificant in any meaningful way. And so it really vindicated the, the uh, reliability of the, the received text in many ways. So the majority text was a positive development in that sense. It added upon that work. But it has kind of one thing that people see as a little bit of a flaw. The main methodology for the majority text is to say, we'll look at all the, the, the manuscripts available, and if there is a variant, if there is a discrepancy, the way we'll resolve the variant and we'll try to get to the heart of the original is by seeing which one is included in the majority of the manuscripts that are available, which one is most dominant in the manuscripts that we have available. Well, on the surface, that seems like it'd be a great idea. Majority wins. It's a democratic process, you know. But in reality, it has kind of two flaws, I think. Number one is that uh, is, uh, is on the age of the documents. So, of course, we have many more documents from, a, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 years after the time of the apostles than we do closer to the time of the apostles. And that's simply because of, you know, natural consequences of, of the scarcity of the, of the original manuscripts because of time and the toll that it's taken on them. So, you know, the idea then of the critical text that we'll see later is we should give more weight, more consideration to the ones that are the most ancient, the oldest, because it seems more likely they'd be closer to the originals. So maybe the majority rule isn't the best rule because we're going to have uh, far more uh, texts that are further removed chronologically from the original autographs. So that's that's one one problem. Uh, we have very few in relation to the whole body. Very few of them are are really ancient. And the the other the other um, challenge or, or criticism of the majority text is that. Uh, not only does it not take age of the text in consideration, but there's a bias for the Eastern text because it's the most dominant. Um, but there's also a bias um, uh, just regionally or location-wise. 
And so, you know, we would expect that a lot of the Eastern texts, the Byzantine text forms, what it's called, uh, that derive from the from the East, the Greek Orthodox tradition as opposed to the Roman Catholic tradition, like we expect them to be more, um, have more of those. And the, re the reason is, is because Greek was the language of Eastern Europe, uh, the Eastern Greco-Roman world, for a full thousand years after uh, it fell out of common usage in Western Europe or the Western Gre Greco Roman world. And so they continued for a thousand more years to use Greek as the primary language and to continue to publish and copy, not publish, but copy more and more uh, copies of these various uh, manuscripts in the Greek language. Whereas in the Western world, uh, Latin took a foothold, and so they begin to translate it into Latin and make copies of those Latin manuscripts at a, at a greater rate than they did the original Greek manuscripts. So there's a there's a there's a Byzantine bias to the majority view, which is not necessarily the the, the best thing. So that is the majority text, and there's very few modern English translations that actually use the majority text. Um, very few. Um, let me see if I can, I will look this part of my notes here. The majority text, the World the World English Bible is probably the most popular one today. There's an analytical literal translation, a modern English Bible, I think dates, uh, oh, I don't remember the date for that, but th those are some of the more popular ones. There's not many, the majority text, whereas the received text from Erasmus, obviously the King James Version, the New King James Version actually used the received text and it was uh, it was actually translated and published in 1982 so relatively new the received text also has the modern english version of 2014 so it is still in use uh that text as a basis textual basis for some but the vast majority the vast vast majority of all modern translations come to us from the critical text, the critical text that would include the newest American Standard Bible, the American Standard Version, the New International Version, the English Standard Version, the uh, New English Translation or the Net Bible, the Christian Standard Bible or the CSB, which was just uh, published in 2017, I believe. Um, and so those are just a few of the popular of the many uh, translations of the Bible that we have that come to us uh, from the critical text. Now, the important thing about the critical text is this. It was also developed beginning in the 19th century. Uh, uh, some scholars by the name of Westcott and Hort are widely credited of compiling the final version of the first critical text. They worked. They completed the work of several other people. They were the first people that had the idea to work on it. But their idea was um, that the main thing was that they, they decided to use an eclectic approach to determining what is the best way to reconcile the variance in the manuscripts. So they said we should consider the age, we should wait very heavily on that because you know they, they thought, and probably rightfully so, it seems, <laughs> seems a rather good idea to me, they, they concluded that if a, if a source is copied, you know, closer to the original, then it should be more reliable. It should be closer to the original. For example, if we have a first generation copy of original autograph, so someone takes the book of Romans and they make a copy of it, we would reasonably suspect that that would be closer to the original, if not identical to the original, than say one that's 10 generations down the road, a copy of a copy of a copy times 10. Um, it seems reasonable to conclude that that, that older one would be, uh, if there's any differences at all between them, no matter how minor there are, it seems that we should, uh, you know, weigh more heavily in the earlier one. And especially if we have a number of different ones to compare to, to make sure it's just not a one-off. But at any rate, you know, the majority text doesn't do that. So it doesn't weigh exclusively on what's the oldest rendering, but it takes that into major consideration. But it does use an eclectic approach. It even uses sometimes uh, Latin and Syriac and other translations, not as a basis for the text itself, but to reconcile some of the variances that do exist. They look, at least look at other translations to see, well, how, 
how was it understood at the time it was translated into this language you know 1500 years ago or whatever it was because that will give us some insight into what they had what they were looking at and now it doesn't weigh heavily into those type of things but it takes a, a, a lot more scientific approach to try to determine what the text said now the goal in both the majority text and the critical text is to try to make it as close as possible to the original rendering of the original text. And so when it comes to this idea of alleged missing verses that, you know, just by virtue of saying missing verses, we're automatically assuming a bias. We're automatically assuming that because this version doesn't exist in this compilation of the text, but it did in this compilation of the text, we're assuming that it was there in the original and it was taken out. But what the people who developed the critical text are saying is we don't believe that this verse was original and it was added and we want to get it to the, to the uh, most uh, original pure sor source as we can. And so we're going to um, remove anything that looks like it was most probably an addition to the original text. So they all have the same theme in mind. Now, if you have, if you grew up reading the King James Version and you grew up reading those words and that rendering and those particular verses and you see any change in a modern translation, your mind will automatically think this verse has been dropped. This word has been deleted. But if you're looking at just for an example, a 14th century Byzantine copy of the Greek New Testament, and you're looking at a 3rd century or 4th century uh, copy of the Alexandrian text form, and there's a verse that's not there in the one that is a thousand years older, but it is there in the one that's a thousand years newer, and especially if you have other uh, manuscripts from the same time periods to substantiate this isn't just a one-off uh, in all of these older uh, copies that wasn't there then you might be inclined to think well perhaps it wasn't there to begin with and it got either accidentally or somehow inadvertently added into the text perhaps it was just a scribal note that later became part of the text and out of all the different variants that exist between all the 5,800 manuscripts we have in the New Testament, there's only about the most comprehensive list I've found is about 70 verses. And again, it's not that these 70 verses are in wide dispute, that they're terribly different in every regard. Most of the time it's just a word or a small phrase uh, that is not there in the critical text because it's not, it was believed that it may have somehow worked its way into the text but wasn't there originally. So both, both concepts, both methodologies are trying to err on the side of being what is most close to the original. What the, what the Word of God actually said in the original autographs, but they use different methods to get there. And again, I want to emphasize this point. <laughs> no moral principle, no spiritual precept, no doctrinal tenet is compromised in any way, shape, or form by these textual differences, by these textual variants. Uh, they're mostly just uh, virtually meaningless, a virtually, I shouldn't say meaningless, virtually insignificant. There are a few significant ones. And what, what I would suggest that you do, uh, let me see if I can find, what I suggest that you do, you can Google and you can, on Wikipedia I found a list of all the differences between the majority text and the, uh, and the critical text. And like I said, there's 70 and you can see for yourself. But in addition to that, if you read, for example, an NIV study Bible, like uh, this question that originated this topic, um, it will have either in the margin, marginal note or in a parenthetical note or in a footnote, it will have a note that usually, especially in the study Bibles, actually includes the alternate rendering of the, of the verse. So it's right there. So it's not like they're trying to hide it or they don't want you to know what it is or anything like that. They're just saying we don't believe for the purposes of, of translating it or uh, of compiling the text. We don't believe it was original, so we're not going to include it. But here's what it is, so you know. 
And also we have the privilege of having access to as many Bibles as we want, in the United States at least. So, you know, I don't know about you, but when I study the Bible, I usually use Bible software and I can just click, click, click on the different versions. I can even take one verse and see what it is in 16 different versions. I can, especially if you read the commentaries or the notes, you know all that information. You know what the decisions were made. So, A, it's much ado about nothing because there's no practical implications of any doctrinal, you know, controversy. Uh, but B, we have access to all the material anyhow. So in my humble opinion, and just from reading and studying this issue um, in many different sources over the years, I personally think that the critical text has the most logical approach, the most scientific approach, uh, the most historically accurate approach to determining what the text is. So the NIV and the CSB and the ESV I would lean on the side that it's probably correct, but we don't know with any degree of certainty. There's other explanations as to why a, a word or a phrase may not have been in the oldest manuscripts and later appeared in some ones a thousand or twelve hundred years later. There might be some, there might be some other explanations that make it le more legitimate, but again, those discrepancies don't change anything doctrinally. They don't change our practical understanding of what the Bible says so it really doesn't matter I think that you know with scholarship and with technology and with um, you know all the many hundreds of years between the received text and the critical text that there's been so many discoveries made and there's been so many eyeballs looking at this that the process has gotten more and more accurate over time the good news is that it's all very accurate. Even the limited resources that Erasmus had, he did an incredible job uh, with what he had to work with. And, and from a practical perspective, there's not, there's no significant compromises that were made. There's no significant problems with the text that we got in the King James Version. So it really boils down to a matter of style in many cases, what translation you want to read. It really boils down to other from for my opinion, other considerations other than the textual basis. I don't really consider the textual basis to be a major consideration in a, what, a Bible I'm going to read. I've read the entire King James Bible through all the way, and I've read other modern translations of the, of the uh, Bible all the way through. I, I look at them both and study them both uh, in my personal you know, studies and development. Currently, for my you know for my annual Bible reading, I'm reading out of the uh, CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, which was just published a couple years ago. I think it's great. And, you know, on another note, I think it's great between the 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 uh, literal and the dynamic equivalency or the verbal and dynamical equivalency. I think it strikes an excellent balance. But that's a topic for another day. And so there's many great translations of the Bible. And the great thing is we have all of them at our disposal to really get, dig in and read more and more and more. I always say, you know, pick a translation of the Bible to read, you know, every day, but it doesn't have to be the same one year after year. You can read one translation this year and a different one next year. Um, you know, you can, you, can, you can have the best of both worlds, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So I hope that this explanation helps you to understand a little bit about why there are differences between the King James Version and other modern translations. It's because of the textual basis and the manuscripts that were available and the method that they determined the best compilation of the available method uh, manuscripts. That's the reason why. There's legitimate, uh, I don't want to say difference of opinion, but differences of approach that result in these different conclusions. But for the for the probably the fourth and the final time, there is no doctrinal tenet that's compromised. There's no spiritual precept that that is jeopardized. There is no moral principle that is compromised uh, as a result of the 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 variance between these manuscripts, or even I would say for the vast majority of English translation, the uh, the translation methodology that's used. Uh, we benefit by having more options and more resources at our disposal. So 
Uh, like I said, I tried to record this podcast a couple of times. I think this is the best effort. So I'm going to leave it there. And uh, certainly, as with all the podcasts, if there's additional questions that rise in your mind as you're listening to this, and you say, I wonder if you could address this, send that to me. I mean, I'd be happy, even if I just take five minutes to address it on a future podcast, I'd be glad to attempt to answer any questions that you might have as a result of this explanation. So thank you for your time in listening today. As always, I appreciate each and every time that each one of you tunes in to Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. So until next time, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Thank you so much for listening. Farewell for now.